Let's start recording. Okay, we are recording now. <clears throat> so the first thing you probably want to do is to go back to Monday's your class, okay, the video, and review how I log using a spreadsheet because your starting point is this Google Sheet here. So the first thing you want to do is to right click on the Google Sheets, um, open it up, okay, and then the next thing you want to do is to make a copy of that. So you click on make a copy. Um, you can make a copy to whatever Google account you sign into. Probably it's going to be the school, your Google account. So uh, make a copy and then use the same convention that I used in <clears throat> Monday's class to log the solving of this particular problem. So I give you your V as a set of vertices, E as a set of edges, uh, D is basically the function mapping the edges to their distances and you know, basically that's all you need to know to run the algorithm. So one thing some people may want to do is to actually make a graphical representation of the graph you know, because it's easier to visualize you go like oh so that's the shortest path and so on. Um, also in this case you know, vertices E, C and E are the destination so you know, I, instead of using S equals to curly braces, you know, C, E inside, I'm just telling you that C and E are the destination uh, vertices. So um, do we have any questions? Because you know, that's your homework assignment. When you are done with this, you don't turn in an Excel spreadsheet file. I'm going to, you know, so stay in the Google Sheet as you work on this, and then your submission is gonna be a link to your Google Sheets. But before you turn it in, make sure you share that with me. And my identity is uh, W0006887. So make sure you share with that particular account because otherwise I cannot see your Google Sheet, your file, then I cannot grade it. So do we have any questions about this particular homework assignment? Okay, and you have one week to do this, which I think is more than sufficient. Um, you know, the first time you do this, you know, the, you uh, follow the algorithm. It might take you a little bit longer, but this is also how you study for the final exam too, because you know, Dijkstra's algorithm and or the A star algorithm is guaranteed to be in the final exam. So going through this you know, whole motion of following the algorithm just to kind of apply that to a particular problem, it's just one way to you know, kind of study for this test for the exam. Do we have any other, do we have any questions about this homework assignment? How to do it, you know, where to find the Dijkstra's algorithm description, <clears throat> or what date we talk about it? That'll be Monday, yep. Mm -hmm. um, that's up to you. So you're referring to this line, right? So that line allows you to scroll one part of the screen without you know, you know, affecting the header. So you, know, you don't have to change, you, you can change it if you want to. You can remove the line altogether. So you can basically just drag it all the way up. I think it's all the way down, sorry. Uh, no, you can go oh, okay. To, uh, okay. Yeah, I thought that's a gooey way to do it too, but I could be wrong. Because that's usually how I do it, is to drag it out of existence. But the answer is, you know, um, that line is only here to separate the two portions of the spreadsheet. I don't think it's going to be that long, you know, because this is a particularly low resolution screen. So when you're doing this, you know, on your home computer, you know, assuming it's 1080p or higher resolution, you should not run out of rows anyway. This is not a long trace. So any other questions? Okay, all right, yep. E, you mean this one? It's E prime. See column C here? Yeah, this is edge, this is the local variable E, which is um, WV. <clears throat> so instead of tracking W, I'm tracking the entire edge you know, in this particular spreadsheet. You can track W if you want to, it's equivalent. Because the edge that you're tracking 
it's really you know, the edge between vertex W and vertex B. So if you use W instead of lowercase e over here, that would give you the same amount of information. So you can use W, you can use E, you know, either way is fine. <clears throat> All right, any other questions? No questions? All right, so you have one week to work on this. I would say, you know, get started early because, you know, uh, we talked about Dijkstra's algorithm on Monday. So hopefully you still have some recollection of that discussion. So you probably want to do this, you know, when you still have a good memory of the algorithm. Because what we're going to do today is to talk about the other algorithm. So we don't want to confuse between the two algorithms. <clears throat> so the other graph algorithm is called the A star algorithm. So we're getting back to the notes now. Okay, so graphs. And then the A star, yes. Um, yes, I am recording. The voice is good, you know, and it's recording from the right screen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the other algorithm is called the A star algorithm, and it's literally A asterisk, you know, algorithm. It is also a, an algorithm to find the shortest path, but this one involves the use of a heuristic function. So we have the same stuff as before. Okay, we have a graph. G has the set of vertices, you know, also it, we have the set of edges. We have a heuristic function on top of the distance function. So the distance function is still here, but the heuristic function is a little bit different. Okay, so it's probably helpful to give you some background about you know, how the A star algorithm is going to help us in a, um, in a, uh, in a search for the shortest path. So what I will do is I'm going to go to Google Maps, okay, because it's good to kind of visualize the whole thing, you know, <clears throat> in terms of you know, finding the shortest path actually between two destinations. So we're going to take a look at the entire U.S., continental U.S. <clears throat> and your job, okay, you know, what we want to do is to start with um, somewhere in Kansas. Let's say, you know, is it called Wichita? Wichita. Sorry? Wichita. Wichita. Okay, Wichita. So let's say we are, you know, we want to go from Wichita, Wichita to San Francisco. Okay? So, you know, you can probably do it very easily by clicking this and then you'll go search for San Francisco. But let's say we don't want to do that. We want to use our own algorithm to do it. So if you are to use the A star algorithm, you're going to have to give the A star algorithm the estimated either distance or time or fuel cost or whatever you want to measure between every single intersection, right? So from here to here, you have to have a number that would be the D, right? The distance of that edge. From here to here, you have to make an edge and so on. But there are a lot of things in between that we cannot see at this point because I'm really zoomed out. <clears throat> so the, eight, the Dijkstra's algorithm, even the unmodified one that you learned from CISP 430, is what we call a breadth-first search algorithm, which means the way it works is we start with <clears throat> the starting point, and then in the first iteration, it will expand it to all the neighboring towns, and then in the second iteration, you know, or it will basically continuing, it will continue to expand the quote-unquote sphere or circle until that circle touches your know, San Francisco all the way over here. So what is there a problem with it? Not really. It will find the shortest path. But the problem is the expansion of the circle is omnidirectional. So that means um, all, the <clears throat> all the places like Kansas City over here, it will explore that even though it's in the opposite direction. It will also explore a whole bunch of other you know, cities like San Luis. It will also expand to explore Cincinnati and all the way to probably Washington in the attempt to find the shortest path to San Francisco. So does it find the right solution? Yes. But if you, all you want to know is how to get from <clears throat> basically in the middle of Kansas, which is uh, Wichita, to San Francisco, why do you want to explore you know, all the way to the East Coast? 
and say, oh, yeah, just in case, right? Just in case your San Francisco is next to New, New York City, we want to explore that too. Hmm? Or Chicago, you know, pizza. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the problem with the with Dijkstra's algorithm. It is expanding in a quote unquote concentric you know, circles. It will go in every direction, including the direction that does not make sense to us. Is that okay? The A star algorithm, on the other hand, would utilize what we call a heuristic. A heuristic is basically a function that is very easy to evaluate. It gives you an estimate of, okay, from here, it's gonna be that far away from this particular city, okay? It will, I will have to drive that kind of distance. So I'll give you an example. Um, so the example is gonna be, uh, let's take you know, Wichita into consideration. So the way we do the estimate is simply to draw a straight line, okay, from Wichita all the way to San Francisco. And then we'll say, okay, that is my estimate of the distance. You go like, well, that's not the actual distance, right? You know, because the, the highway goes up and down. And <clears throat> But the point is, you just need an estimate that is not overestimating. So if you draw a straight line, okay, cutting through the crust of Earth from Wichita to San Francisco, that's guaranteed to be a shortcut. That, that's going to be a, a, an underestimate of the actual road distance between you know, Wichita and San Francisco. Does that make sense? So it's a good estimate. So by using what we call the heuristics, which is really just an estimate that is always not overestimating, <clears throat> in that case, you know, we are going to stop you know, um, exploring too far to the east in this case because it would not make sense anymore. Now, you might explore a little bit down here, maybe Oklahoma City, maybe it's faster to get down to Oklahoma City and then you know, head out you know, to the west, you know, as opposed to you know, going straight up here to go to Denver first. Okay? I don't know exactly what the distances play out, but it's possible. Okay? They look like they're, they're possible. But it doesn't make sense to go all the way San, to St. Louis. Okay? That's, just, that's just way too far to the east to make sense. Is that okay? So the A star algorithm is different compared to Dijkstra's algorithm because we include a heuristic function as an estimate. So the, basically the idea is you, you start with uh, Wichita <coughs> and then you explore and go like, okay, let's try Kansas City. So what you do is you look at this particular edge here and then you add the actual distance of the edge to the estimated distance between Kansas City and San Francisco. If that's already longer than you know, another path, let's say going through Oklahoma City and then straight out to you know, San Francisco as an estimate, then we know, okay, let's not expand from Kansas City yet. Okay? You know, we might have to get there if we find out later on that you know, going from uh, Oklahoma City to San Francisco turns out to be kind of long, but we just, don't want to play with that just yet, okay? It doesn't make sense. Is that okay? So that's the gist of the A star algorithm, is making use of a heuristic function to help guide the expansion of the sphere. So if you think about the expansion of the sphere of cities that we are considering, Dijkstra is concentric, okay? We started with Wichita, and then we just expand equal distance on all sides until we touch San Francisco. Dijkstra's, I mean, the A star algorithm would be a very uh, lopsided ellipse. So you know, on one side, it will probably just go all the way to maybe Kansas City, but the other side is gonna be, you know, just, it's, it's a very flat ellipse all the way to San Francisco. Is that okay? Can, can you guys kind of picture that in your head? <clears throat> maybe uh, if I zoom out a little bit here, I can draw that picture a little. So if you're using Dijkstra's algorithm, you'll be basically expanding a circle that is going to be larger and larger and larger and larger until it touches your San Francisco. But if you're using the A star algorithm, the kind of city that you'll be expanding and exploring will be kind of more of an ellipse, kind of like only on this side.
it is not an award. It is more of an estimate. So all we are trying to do is to find a non-overestimating estimate between the uh, vertices. So it doesn't have to be precise. It can be way off too, okay? If it, as long as it is not overestimating, the A star algorithm will still find the shortest path. All right, so that's kind of the gist of it, okay? So what we'll do next <clears throat> is we're gonna take a look at the algorithm itself. So we'll take a look at the algorithm, which is in the second part of the module that we have already talked about. <clears throat> So the heuristic function is described here, and it looks like it is the same kind of thing as a distance function, but that is not the case. Um, it's actually not the case because um, in this case, this is actually, ideally speaking, you know, this is how we want the heuristic function to look like. The domain is the Cartesian product of the set of vertices and itself, and then the, the codomain are the un negative real numbers. So we can basically define the heuristic function between any two vertices. It's just an underestimate. That's basically what it is. It's an underestimate of the shortest path between any two vertices. All right? So that's a description. <clears throat> um, now we can always define you know, the heuristic function to be a zero, which means there's no information in the heuristic function. In that case, the A star algorithm, quote unquote, degenerates into Dijkstra's algorithm because there's no information to inform you which way you wish we should expand the vertices. So you can deform you know, the A star algorithm back to Dijkstra's algorithm by making the heuristic function always return zero. <clears throat> but it will still do the right thing. It might explore a few more X vertices, but it will still find the shortest path as long as the heuristic function is not overestimating, we're still fine. All right, so with all that said, the actual algorithm is down here. It is slightly longer in terms of the description, so let me see if I can fit in the entire thing on the screen. Just about, okay, because the last part is not, the actual algorithm is down here. What is up here is really um, the initialization of what we need in order to run the algorithm. So we're gonna go through <clears throat> the first part and then we get into the actual algorithm itself. All right, so the first two bullet points are not really particularly um, new to us, okay? Because the way we represent a graph using a set of vertices and a set of edges, we talked about that on Monday already, okay? Same deal as Dijkstra's algorithm. And then the fact that we also have a distance function mapping each edge to a non-negative real number, we got that on one day too, okay? Because we have to find a way to quantify the cost of going from one vertex to another vertex you know, along an edge. In this case, in the A star algorithm, we can only have one start vertex and I'm not sure. I think one start vertex and one destination vertex because of the use of the heuristic function. So some of the cool things that we did with Dijkstra's algorithm is no longer possible because you know, the uh, heuristic function has to go from a vertex to another vertex. So that means you know, this particular algorithm has to have one single start vertex and one single destination vertex. So in this notation, it is uh, vertex S is a start and then vertex x, x marks the destination or x marks the, you know, the place where you want to be. So that's why x is the destination vertex. So this is new, okay? You know, we have a heuristic function, which in the most general form is mapping the Cartesian product of v with itself to the set of uh, non-negative real numbers. <clears throat> And this heuristic function just has to make sure that we are underestimating or not, over, uh, not overestimating the actual cost of the shortest path from V to W. So when you look at the, the value of this you know, H V W, it just has to be not overestimating the actual length of the shortest path. So uh, the underestimating aspect also you know, is referred to as admissible. So in this case, you know, the 
uh, heuristic is said to be admissible if it is not overestimated. It's just a term. <clears throat> so now, you know, the initialization, for the initialization, we look at every single vertex V, lowercase v, that is a vertex, we want to initialize the following. But there's a conditional statement here. If V is not the starting point, then we do this. If V is the, is the starting point, then we do it like this. So let's take a look at the initialization um, because there are two functions that we have to deal with in this particular algorithm. Instead of uppercase L, which is the length of the shortest path known up to this point from a vertex to a destination, G is representing, <clears throat> okay, it explains here, is the actual length of the shortest known path from vertex S to V in this case. So um, v, G of V is the actual length of the shortest known path from S to V, but it doesn't get to the destination. Is that okay? But it, but it changes over time because as we expand <clears throat> the circle, as we explore more alternative paths, G of V can change over time. F of V is G of V plus something. So F of V is the, estimate, the estimation of the length of the shortest path from vertex S, which is our starting point, through vertex V, which is the parameter, to the destination. So I think at this point, the tablet may come in handy because you know, this way we can just visually see you know, what is the G value versus what is the F value. <clears throat> it's going to take a while because you know the the tablet has to start from beginning again, so it's going to take a little bit of time to start up. And I need to get one of the USB connections. <clears throat> okay, so this is starting up. Um, so let's see whether this makes sense. Okay, whether we should initialize both of these to infinity. The idea of in initializing both of these to infinity when V is not the starting point is we don't even know whether vertex V is reachable from the start vertex. In other words, do we really have edges that can help us connect from the start vertex to vertex V? We don't know, okay? So we are making the worst case uh, assumption that they are not connected. So if they are not connected, then we can also say that the path has a length of infinity because you know, these two vertices are not actually connected. Okay, so now my tablet is started up. I can go to 440, start a new notepad, <coughs> and then start up the uh, copying of the screen. So this is a screen copy. Uh-oh. It doesn't like it. Okay. What is it complaining? Okay. Hmm. So ADB is the start server. Hmm, okay, ADB kill server. There we go. I just had a remnant of some you know, ADB server running from before. <clears throat> All right, okay. So this is much better because now we can actually draw some pictures. So vertex S is the starting point. Uh, vertex X is where we want to go. Vertex V is our parameter. So G of V is the length of the actual path from vertex S to vertex V. This is G of V. Is that okay? So it's actual. This is the actual length of the shortest known path from vertex S, the starting point, to some vertex V, which is our parameter. <clears throat> is that okay? So between vertex V and vertex X, okay, between these two, 
I'm going to use dotted line here because we do not know what is happening between these two. But I can have a heuristic value of h of vx, which is an estimate. Okay, so h of vx is guaranteed to be a non overestimating estimate of the actual shortest path between vertex v and the destination. It's just a guess, okay? But it's guaranteed not to give you an overestimate. Is that okay? Yes? Okay, so here comes your f of v. And I think it helps to change the color to, <clears throat> say, green. So when you follow this path here, you know, so all the, this path here, and then you follow the green you know, dotted line here, that green stuff is f of v. So that means you know, f of v is really just g of v plus h of vx. It is an estimate of the shortest path from vertex s, the starting point, through vertex v to the destination. One part of it is known, is exact, the other part is just an estimate. But it gives us the ability to go to, to, to be informed. It's like, um, so if this estimate is worse than the shortest known path already, maybe we don't care about vertex v anymore because there, there are some alternative paths you know, somewhere else with a starting point going through that to the destination has a lower number. Are we doing okay so far with you know, what f of v is representing versus what g of v is representing? Okay, the ultimate goal is to find the shortest path from s to x. But we want to find out you know, what vertices should we go through on that shortest path. So this is a tool to help us evaluate whether something is a good candidate or not you know, when we are trying to find that path. Is that good? Okay. So initially, <clears throat> if we go back to the algorithm, you can see that when v and s are the same thing, then the g value is a zero. Does that make sense to you? In other words, when we go back to this picture here, if g and v are the same thing, what do you think is the length of the shortest path from vertex s to itself? Zero. So it makes sense to initialize g of s to a zero. What about f of s? So when you look at the algorithm, f of s, or f, you know, because you know, in this case, v and s are the same thing, so f of s is really just you know, h of um, the starting point, which is v also, to the destination. In other words, in that particular case, the dotted line that we are looking at is starting from here all the way to here. That's the overall estimate of, you know, Okay, so if I were to estimate you know, what is the length of the shortest path from the starting point all the way to the destination, that is h of sx. Are we good so far? Okay, so that's how we initialize everything. <clears throat> so getting back to the algorithm. So instead of a set q, this time we have a set o, <coughs> and I cannot remember why I named this new set o, but it's, uh, it serves about the same purpose as set Q, except with some twists, okay? So it's a little bit different. So O is initialized to a set only containing the starting point, the start vertex. So instead of the entire set of destination vertices in Dijkstra's algorithm, in this case, we're starting with the starting point, the start vertex. Um, and then the algorithm, the actual algorithm part, is this part here, okay? Everything else, you know, earlier, that's just initialization. So in this case, you know, we have some, an interesting um, condition to stay in the loop. So the first thing we want to do is to look at the condition here and make sure that we understand what it means. Okay, so we're gonna focus on just that condition. And it says, as long as, okay, while there exists a vertex V in O, big uppercase O, such that f of v is less than g of x, we go through the loop here. Okay, what does it mean? Why do we stay in the loop when that condition is true? What does it mean when the condition is false? So we want to explore that, okay? We want to explore what does it mean when the condition is false, that we cannot find 
a vertex B in the set O such that F of B is less than G of X. First of all, what is G of X? So let's go back to the picture, okay? See if we can relate <coughs> these two things. So we look at the picture here. So instead of G of V, we are now looking at G of X. What is G of X? Hmm? No, it's not zero. What is the meaning of G of X? Yep. It is, exactly. So it is the length of the shortest path known up to this point from the starting point all the way to the destination. It is an act, the length of an actual path. So that's G of X. So let me, let me, let me just kind of draw that in this picture. So we'll choose uh, yet another color. Let's try a deep blue or dark blue. So G of X is basically, you know, this is an actual path. So squiggly line is representing an actual path. So the blue line, or when you look at the length of the blue line, that is G of X. It is the length of the shortest known path known up to this point from the start vertex to the destination vertex. Okay? All right, so that's one of the things involved in the condition. What is the other thing involved in the condition? Okay, we are looking at every single element in O, and we want to see if there is um, at least one vertex, V, such that you know, f of v is less than g of x. What does that mean? So think about you know, f of, you know, think about the green line here. The green line, the green stuff here, which consists of the actual length of the shortest path from s to some vertex v. We don't know what, which one it is, but it's some vertex, plus the heuristic value from v all the way to x. So when you combine these two, that is f of v. So what happens when f of v is greater than g of x? What is that telling you? Let's just say there's only one vertex left in O, okay, and that's v. And f of v is already greater than g of x. What does that mean? Hmm? There's a shorter path already. Mm, not quite, but I think you're getting to the right idea. It's just the opposite direction, so go ahead. It means I don't have to figure out what this is, okay? This is an estimate. The dotted line is an estimate, but I don't really care because the dotted line is guaranteed not to be an overestimate. So when you look at the not overestimate plus the actual distance, and it's already more than the blue line, and this is the only alternative I have left, I don't have to look any further because I know if I explore the dotted line here, if I go any further, that path cannot be any shorter than the blue path. Does that make sense? Okay, because when you look at the inverted version of this condition here, it's basically saying for every lowercase v in O, f of v is greater than or equal to g of x, which means I got alternatives, okay? I got the you know, v1, v2, v3, and so on, but every single one cannot have a path cannot be on a path that is shorter than the path already discovered from the starting point to the destination. So that's why you know, the condition to terminate looks like this. It looks more complicated than the one in Dijkstra's algorithm because we have to basically evaluate this and go like, because we can give up earlier. We can look at you know, all the vertices. We can have a bazillion vertices in O, but if every single vertex in O is going to say, oh, you can go through me to get to the destination, but guess what? The length of that path is guaranteed to be longer or at least as long as the shortest known path between the start and the end vertex. You go like, okay, so why would I waste my time to look any further? Because you know, there's no way that path can be any shorter than the one that I have already discovered. Is that okay? So this part of the explanation is connecting <clears throat> the um, statements, you know, the quantified statement here, to the meaning of the algorithm and what we're trying to do. So
So this is kind of important. And this is probably the most difficult part to explain because I can explain the notation. You know, that's not difficult to explain. But what the, the, what the notation is doing in the context of the algorithm, that's the one part that is really difficult to explain. And you kind of have to spend time to look at it. You know, draw some graphs, you know, and kind of, you know, that way you get more understanding of the algorithm itself. Okay, so if we get into the loop, okay, what does it mean when we get into the loop? From the pictorial representation, if there's only one vertex V in O and the condition here is true, that means, oh, the green stuff here, F of V itself, is less than G of V. Maybe, just maybe, if I follow the green stuff here and explore further, this ends up to be a shorter path than the blue path. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so that means by the time we get to the first bullet point in the while loop, we are basically saying, well, we still have some hope that we can find a path shorter than the one that we have, we have already, already discovered from the start vertex to the end vertex, to the destination. Okay, then what do we do? If there are multiple vertices you know, meeting that requirement, then what do we do? Well, we, get, we are getting back to the greedy algorithm thing. Remember the, the term greedy algorithm, which I say, you know, well, that's a misnomer. We should have called that the most optimistic approach, okay? So we are trying to be optimistic and go like, well, if there are multiple vertices in O, then we want to find the one that has the shortest F value. Okay, so if I go back to look at the picture here, it means you know, if I have multiple vertices, including this V in the set O, we'll call another one W. Okay, so we'll use a different color. <clears throat> this type of thing is really working out for me. I'm not sure about you, but I'm having fun here. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so let's call, let's say that there's a vertex W over here, and we draw a squiggly line, okay? This is you know, basically a G of W. And then we do a dotted line from W all the way to X. So the dotted line you know, from here to here is H of WX. That's our his heuristic value from vertex W all the way to the destination. It is guaranteed not to overestimate, okay? So when we add up these two, okay, when you add up these two, you add up the G value and the H value, it becomes F of W. Is that okay? So F of W is really the purple version of the green stuff. Are we good so far? So let's just say that both of these, you know, F of W and F of V are both less than G of X, which means, oh, the shortest path could be either way, okay? then how are you gonna choose which one to explore first? That becomes the question. Is I got multiple candidates, I can you know, look at V and find out you know, what, is the, what, what the outgoing edges are you know, out of V, or I can look at you know, vertex W and look at the outgoing edges of W, but which one, I, which one should I explore first? So what do you think would be the criteria? According to the optimistic slash greedy algorithm principle. Not just the heuristic, it is the sum of the heuristic function and the G value to the actual vertex. So basically what we're doing is we're adding this portion plus this portion here. This portion here, G of W is actual. It is the actual length of the shortest path known up to this point from vertex S to vertex W, that's actual, okay? But the heuristic is between W and X, that's an estimate. So we add up those two. What do you mean by one direction at a time? Nope. It, at this point, it has to decide between, should we look further from W or should I look further from V? That's the question. Because they both can contain the shortest path but I don't know which one. I can only explore one of them at the same, at one time. So the question is which, which one should I choose? 
So the greedy slash optimistic algorithm principle says, well, just look at f of w versus f of v. Whichever one is smaller will pick that you know, vertex. So that's the whole idea of what we call greedy algorithms, is we just look at the most promising candidate and try that out first. Okay. So in this case, the, the way I specify that in the code is let C be a, a member of the set O such that every W in O, all, the, all vertices in O, when you look at the F value of C, it has to be less than or equal to F of W. In other words, if there's a tie, pick whichever one, okay? But if there, if there are no ties, we choose the, the smallest. Is that okay so far on the first bullet point inside the while loop? Okay, so we pick one of them to explore. And then the next thing we do is similar to what we did in Dijkstra's algorithm, is when we have selected a vertex to explore, we take it out of the boundary set because you know, we are now expanding this one, it's taken care of. So we have to remove it from set O in this case. And then this loop here looks like the same kind of loop inside Dijkstra's algorithm, except this time, instead of looking into incoming edges, we're looking at outgoing edges. So in this case, you know, we are looking at edges you know, CN, and C is the one that we chose earlier. So CN is an outgoing edge from the perspective of C. Does that make sense? Okay. So once we have chosen you know, the edge, the neighbor N, you know, which is connected by a CN edge, an outgoing edge from C, what are we going to do? Well, this time, you know, I actually used a local temporary variable to store a value first. So we are adding G of C and D of CN. What is that, right? So if I switch back to the picture here, so let's say in this case, we have chosen B to be the one that we want to explore first, okay? So let's just say that, um, okay, I have to go back to green. So let's say, you know, in this case, you know, G has, I mean, V has an actual edge leading to Z, okay? So, and, and this is V of B, Z, all right? So what do you think is um, G of V plus V of V, Z representing? The temporary value, but what is the uh, significance of that temporary value. Okay. You, yeah, well, I, I changed the name of the vertex. This is Z here. Okay, I think you're on, you're, you're on it. You want to finish it? <laughs> That's okay. Because I, I, I can see that you, you got the idea, okay? So the sum of G of V and D of VZ is the length of a path from the start vertex to the vertex Z. Does that make sense? Okay, now is it shorter than the one that we knew already or is it, nah, this is not a good path from the start vertex to Z? We'll evaluate that later. But the bottom line is when you add up G of V and D of VZ in this case, we are now getting the length of a path from the start vertex to vertex Z. Are we good with that? Okay, we don't know whether it's a better path or not, we just know that it is the length of a path from the start vertex going through vertex V to vertex Z in this case. Okay, so in our algorithm, okay, so I have to kind of clarify and make sure that we understand that in the algorithm, the name of the variables is not exactly the same here. So in our algorithm, this is your know, variable C and this is variable N. So I do have to clarify it just so that we can map the example back to the algorithm itself. So in the algorithm, T is basically the actual length of the shortest known path from S to C. And then you know, we add the distance from C to N, which means the sum is the actual length of a path from the start vertex to vertex n. So what we do next is we compare that. We compare the length 
of the path that we just discovered, which is t, to the shortest to the length of the shortest path known up to this point for vertex n. Because if t is less than n, then we just found a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex n, and then we got a bunch of stuff to update. Does that make sense? So we, I, I can pause a little bit here just to make sure that we are following the logic all the way up to this point where we have a condition to evaluate to decide, okay, do we not have anything to worry about? Or did I just discover a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex n? Because if I did, I got stuff to update. So are we good with that? All right, okay. So now let's just say that we found a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex n, then I got stuff to update. The first thing we do, okay, these can be kind of in any order that we want. So the first thing we do is we add vertex n to the set O, okay, because you know now n becomes the new frontier of that particular exploration. If I go back to the graph here, if I found if I just found a shorter path to z compared to what I had before, this becomes the new frontier. The new frontier is no longer this vertex, but this vertex over here. So that's why I have to add vertex n or the vertex corresponding to variable n to the set O to remind myself it's like, oh, we just updated the g value of this vertex here. It might have you know, more influence as you're further down. So that's why it is added to the vertex O. And then in this case, I don't have an E prime. So the way I keep track of the shortest path is I keep track of how did I get here? So the previous of n is now updated to be c. It could be something else before, it may be undefined earlier, but now in order, I just remember, in order to get to n, I'm going to, um, I will get to n from c. So the whole point of previous is by the time we solve the entire thing, we would have the vertex x, it has its own previous, that vertex will have its own previous, that vertex will have its own previous, and then eventually tracking all the previous, we can track all the way back to the starting point. So the, so the previous is basically a back pointer, if you will, to the previous node. Yep. Uh -huh. it's, just a, it's just a number, that is correct. The previous is not a number. So the previous vertex. Yep. So the previous of something is either undefined because it does not have a previous, or it is a vertex. And you know, in notation-wise, okay. So if you want to look at previous as a function, um, it can be described as you know, this is previous. It is a function. The domain is going to be all the vertices but the codomain is going to be a little bit more complicated because it's not just all the vertices, because you also have to union that with you know, what we call an undefined you know, value. Because you know, this, everything start off with undefined previous because we don't know whether there's a previous or not. So that's why you know, this is guaranteed not to be an injection because you have more elements in the codomain than there are elements in the domain. All right, so getting back here, okay. So the next thing we do is we update you know, G of N because you know, guess what? We just found a length of a alternate path that is shorter than the one that we have already discovered. So let's keep track of that. And then F of N is kind of the same thing because we just updated you know, G of N. So F of N also needs to be updated because G of N has updated, but H of N X never changes, okay? You know, that's always going to be the same, but we have to add up these two to become f, which is the length of the shortest, the estimated length of the shortest path from the start vertex through vertex n to the destination. That's basically what f of n is trying to represent. Does anyone want me to repeat that sentence? Because I can still remember it now. Okay, we good? Or do you want me to repeat? Repeat? Or, huh? Yeah. Repeat, okay. f of n, is the estimated length of the shortest path from the start vertex through vertex n to the destination. The key is 
through vertex n. So the system is going to track a lot of the alternatives at the same time, start vertex, through this vertex to the end, to the destination, start vertex, through this vertex to the destination. It keeps track of a lot of those f values. And every time we have to choose, we are choosing the most promising vertex, the through vertex, because you know, that estimated length is the shortest. Is that okay so far? Okay, yep. Yeah, I will demonstrate it. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the entire loop. So the after, you know, after this, you know, the last portion of the algorithm is the construction of a solution graph in this case. So the solution graph, I just call G of SX, you know, because S is the starting point, X is the destination. It has the same set of vertices, but the set of all the edges are you know, different. So the way it's constructed is to go through this algorithm here. This is you know, basically it's a description. For every W in vertex, the, in the vertex set, if there is, if pref of W equals to V, then we put VW into the set of ESX. So that defines the membership of the solution set. All right, so that's about you know, the algorithm itself. So now we can move on to, do, you know, to make, use an example to illustrate how it works. So let's go to the next slide in the tablet, on the tablet. So we can try to set up something that's uh, tricky, okay? You know, because you know, that's, you know, this way we can see how it can repeat. We can go back to something that, that we thought we had a solution earlier. It's going like, no, that wasn't a good solution. Let's update that. All right, so we have uh, the start vertex, okay? And then from the start vertex, you know, these are um, distances of the edges, okay? So it goes here with an edge of, say, five, and it goes here with um, an edge of distance three. It goes here with an edge of a distance one. And then what we do is from here, um, we'll, Okay, we need a name for that vertex. So let's call this B. This is C, this is D. So from vertex B, we, okay, this is gonna be a one, and this is gonna be a two. Yeah, I think that's good enough. So this goes all these all go to the same place. We'll call this vertex E over here. Okay. So this is how the graph is constructed. The trick is how do you define the H value, the heuristic value? Now in reality, the heuristic value should be something that's easy to compute, such as the actual length of the straight line between two points is a good underestimate of the actual travel distance between those two points. But in this case, I can customize the H you know, value to try to trick the algorithm as much as possible. So that it goes back and goes like, oh, that wasn't a great idea. That wasn't a great idea either. So we want to trick the algorithm to do things multiple times. So the way we trick it is to say H of BX is a zero, okay? We, we are trying to trick the algorithm to follow a path that is not gonna work out. And then we say B of CX is, well, it has to be a non-overestimate, so it can be one over here. Oh, that's not, is it gonna work out? Oh, wait, this one does not have an, does not have a value yet. So we have to give it a value. And then C E is, well, we can make it a two. You know, the distance can be a two. So this way the H value can be exactly two. And the H of D X is also going to be, okay, that's not gonna work. I'm trying to set it up so that we can, I can trick it to go to the, the wrong path as much as possible. 
All right, I'm going to have to make some adjustments. Sorry. Okay, so. Make this a four. And this is a five one. Make this a three. There we go. And then make that a two. Make that a one. Two. Make that a one. Okay, make that a one. And then make that a four. There we go. Okay, so this would do a little bit of tricking. It doesn't do the worst case of kind of tricking. What I'm trying to do is to set up the heuristic value so that it would think that going through B is the best way to get to the destination, only to find out later on that it is not. Oh, okay, I remember that. I got the whole thing flipped. The initial edge, you know, the one that has the least value should be the should be the wrong edge to follow. Yep, that's the way. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to make some changes again. Um, okay, so. It has to do with you know, these particular values. Okay, so the, the D looks the most promising, and but it turns out to be one of the worst because I can make it a seven here. And But to make it look promising, um, X of DX needs to be a small value so that you know the algorithm will go like, oh, that looks really promising, let's do that. There we go. There we go. And then I have to make uh, C the second, you know, most promising thing. <clears throat> so it only has to be smaller by a little bit. So I can make this a three. But I have to make sure that it is also, you know, looking. So the, the existing H value is fine. And then the actual shortest path. So we have eight, we have six, and then the actual shortest path, oh, that's not gonna do very well, but I can change the value just a little bit. Turn this into a four. <clears throat> and then the actual edge or distance is gonna be a one. And then the H value is reflecting exactly the length of the shortest path, which is just the one in this case. Okay, so I think this is gonna work out. All right, so the idea of this particular setup is I want to trick the A star algorithm to explore all the non-shortest path and then only to realize it's like, oh, that is not gonna work out. Oh, that is not gonna work out either. Oh, this is the last option, turns out to be the best option. So that's the intention of the way I set up the heuristic values. All right, so we want to see how that works. So let me see if I can I'm trying to decide how to do this. I think with this one, I can just write on the side here so I don't have to flip flop between the two, the two screens or the two windows. All right, <clears throat> let's do that. And I want to turn off your know, gestures. Okay, for the most part, they turned off. So I think we should be fine. All right, so we have O, you know, the set O, you know, as one of the things we have to track. We have, um, that's, I'm looking at the algorithm here on the side. We have C, we have N. So those are the three variables that we have to track as we execute the algorithm. And then we have the G values, and then we have the F values. Under the G values, you know, there's one G value for A, B, C, D, and E. Under the F values, we have you know, A, B, C, D, E as well. And I'll just, I'll just use a straight line to kind of separate the, F, the G versus the F, the N versus the G, the C versus the N, and then the O versus the C. Okay, there we go. So this is all good. All right, the initialization is the O needs to start with a start vertex, which is S in this case. 
So we just say, okay, this is a set with one single element, which is S, okay? Uh, C is not known yet to, uh, because we are not in the loop. We're still trying to go through the initialization. Yep. Hmm? Oh, that's supposed to be, okay, I can I'll just do the most lazy thing, which is changing this to A. <laughs> now we don't have S anymore. We have to fix that one too. Oh, well, tool, there we go. Yeah, so typically x is the variable representing the destination vertex. So in this case, you know, x is your know, vertex E. Okay. Yep. In this case, yes. Mm -hmm. So the algorithm uses x as a variable that designates you know, what, where the destination is. In this case, you know, the destination is vertex E. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, so now we can initialize the G values. So the G values are relatively easy to deal with. Anything other than a start vertex will have infinity. The start vertex itself is gonna have a zero, a value of zero because we are looking for the path, the length of the shortest path from the start vertex from you know, to that particular vertex. Since A is our best, uh, start vertex, so the G value is gonna be a zero. Everyone else is going to have infinity. The f value is the g value plus the h value. So I need to also you know, designate what is h of ax. So that only has to be a non-overestimating value. This one really does not matter. So we can make it a zero if we want to. So that means you know, f of a is going to be zero. And then the f value of all of the other ones are also going to be just infinities. Are we, good? Are we okay so far with the initialization? A is our start vertex, E is our destination. All right, so this is our starting point. So now we go through the loop. Um, well, okay, before we go through the loop, we have to ask the question, do we want to perform any further operation? In other words, of all the vertices in O, can I find at least one of them having an F value that is less than the G value at the destination? So the G value of the destination is infinity. The only element in O is vertex A. The F value of vertex A is a zero. Is zero less than infinity? Okay, so we should go into the loop. And since there, there's only one vertex to meet the requirements, so variable C has nowhere to go except for, variable, except for vertex A. And then at that point, we also want to take A out of the set so O is now an empty set. But at this point, we also want to look at all the outgoing edges of vertex A. Um, the ordering is not really that important. You guys tell me which one you want to explore first. We're looking at the outgoing edges of vertex A. Which one do you want to explore first? C, okay, we'll do C. So N is C, the neighboring you know, thing is C. I forgot the column for T in this case. But we can figure that uh, we can figure out t without you know having a column. All right. So the way we figure out t is we're looking at g of c, which is g of a, plus the distance um, between c and n. So we're looking at the edge, the distance of the edge ac. So g of a is a zero, okay, and the distance of the edge ac is a three. So we have zero plus three as local variable t. Um, I can probably just put in parentheses here and say three. So the number in parentheses is t, okay? So now the question is, I'm comparing that to g of n, n is c, what is g of c at this point? It's infinity. It's three less than infinity. Yep, okay. So that means we go into the then portion of the conditional statement. We got a few things to update. So the first thing we update according to the algorithm is we update O. So at that point, your O is going to have C as a member. So you know, if you're looking at the code, you know, we are looking at this one here. I know it's only partially exposed. 
and then we update the previous of n, which I forgot to um, I forgot to uh, update to. So for that, I'm going to just going to use a colored edge on the graph itself. So we use a light blue color. <clears throat> so we just have to say, oh, to get to C, we want to start from A. So that's the uh, previous of C is A. That's how I denote that. Is that okay? Are we good so far? The light blue is representing the previous. So in order to, the previous of C is A you know, by coloring that edge. Oh, okay, it's a really, okay, let's see here, pick a purple, oh, that's better, okay, all right, <clears throat> so that takes care of the previous, and then we have to update the G value, the G value is just going to be a three, So the three goes to the C, so C is now updated to have a G value of three. And then the F value is G of C, which is a three, plus the heuristic of one, because your H of CX is a one. Um, so we have a four in this case. So the F value of C is now a four. So just to make sure that we know which one we are dealing with here, that's what we are doing. Is that okay? So now we have updated the set O, the previous. We have updated the G value as well as the F value. Yep. Plus, you know, H of CX or C of H of CE. All the X are basically E's. All right, so that's one outgoing edge. What is the other, out, what, which other outgoing edge do you want to update? Pick one. Hmm? B, okay, so we'll, look, we'll explore B next. So C, so the end is B, the neighbor that we're exploring is B. So the first thing we want to do is to compute the value of T. So now we are looking at, <clears throat> G of A, okay, plus D of AB. D of AB is a four, so T is going to be a four in this case. So T is four, and what we want to compare to is G of B. What is G of B at this point? Infinity. It's still infinity, okay, so it's four less than infinity. Yes, okay, so we got a whole bunch of stuff to update again. First thing to update is to add B to the set O. And then you know, I'm just following these you know, operations here, down here. So the next thing is to update the previous of N. In this case, it's B. So we use the purple color again. And then we basically just say, oh, if you want to go from, you know, if you want to get to B, you know, you know, start with A. So we use the purple edge AB. Um, and then we update the G value and also the F value now. So the G value is basically just T, which is already computed. It's four. So G of B is now updated to a four. F of B is going to be the four plus whatever H of BX is, which is also a one. So four plus one is a five. Is that okay? Yes. I hope. Okay. And that you know that takes care of the second out of the three edges, the outgoing edges from vertex A. So the third one, we don't have a choice except you know it's going to be a D. So once again, we have to compute the value of T. So we are looking at G of A, which is a zero, plus D of A D, which is a one. Zero plus one is a one. Okay. So we're looking at one here. And we're asking, is one less than the G value of D at this point? So at this point, the, D, the G value of D is still infinity. So that means, yep, okay, T is less than G of D at this point. So we have to go through all of these things inside the conditional statement. 
First thing is to add D to the set. So now the set O has B, C, D in it. And then the next thing we need to do is to update the previous. So now we use the purple line to indicate to go to get to vertex, um, from vertex D, we, want, we are going back to vertex A. So that's why we draw this purple line here. And then the next thing we do is to update your G of N and, all, and then F of N. So to do that, <coughs> we just, the, the G value is easy because it's just a copy of T. So now we put a one over here. And then the F value is the one plus whatever the heuristic function is from D to X or the destination, which is a zero. So that means you know, the F value of D is also going to be just one in this case. All right, are we still doing okay so far? Okay, so that completes one iteration through the while loop. And now we go back to the beginning of the while loop. So this time we have three elements in O and we have to ask, um, is at least one of these having an F value that is less than the G value of the destination? The G value of the destination is still infinity. And all of the F values that, that we are considering are less than infinity. So now we say, yep, this condition is satisfied. So we get into the loop. Are we good with that? Okay. And now we say, well, of all the vertices in O, which one has the least F value? So we look at these ones. Uh, B has an F value of three. C has, a, has an F value of four. D has an F value of one. Let's pick D. Is that okay? This is where the greedy slash optimistic algorithm you know, thing comes in, is we look, the, we look at the most promising option. So now we say, okay, let's pick D out of O, which means O now only has B and C remaining. And then we look at the outgoing edge. There's only one coming out of D, which is DE. So we look at the neighbor E, and now we compute T. T is G of D in this case, which is a one, plus the actual edge distance, which is a seven. One plus seven is an eight. But then you have to ask, is eight less than g of e at this point? g of e is an infinity. Eight is less than infinity. It's true. So we go into the conditional statement again. So that means you know, we have to add e to the set. So b, c, e is now the content of the set O. And then we update the previous edge. Okay, so we change the color to purple. And this time we indicate to get to E, we go through D first. So now we use a purple edge here, okay? This is our previous. That's gonna change later, okay? So I'm not sure how well I can remove you know, that purple edge, but we'll try, okay? Um, and then the next thing we do is G of N, it needs to be updated to the value of T. So in this case, we just copy the value of T to G of E. So G of E is here, we update it to eight. And then the E value is also just eight because even though it's not spelled out, X of XX is always zero. The vertex, the, the non-overestimating distance from a vertex to itself is a zero. Okay, that kind of makes sense. All right, so that completes the inner loop because you know, that's the only outgoing edge. So we are completing the entire you know, while loop. We go back to the beginning. So as we go back to the beginning, we ask this question again. Of all the vertices in the set O, which in this case only has B, C, and E, do we have at least one vertex having an F value that is less than G of E because E is our destination? So G of E is no longer infinity, it is an eight. So we are now asking f of b is a three, f of c is a four, is at least one of these two less than eight? Okay, yes, so we still have hope of finding a shorter path because we found a path already. It's just, is it the shortest? 
So this time, <coughs> which one should I use as my uh, variable C? Which one has is, looks the most promising between B and C? I think B looks the most promising. So we take B out this time. <coughs> and then we take it out of the set. So the set still has B, C, uh, C and E in it. Huh? Oh, that's a five? Yeah. Oh, poor penmanship. <laughs> so we have to pick C, right? Because uh, this is a five here. It's just really, really bad penmanship here. All right, so we are picking out C. Oh, okay, I have to remove the other one too. So. Uh. Okay, so we have B and E left because C is the one we, that we are choosing. Because C is four, your F of C is four, F of B is five, so we choose C as the one that we explore next. All right, so vertex C has one single outgoing edge to E, so we explore that. So now we have to recompute the value of T. So what do you think is the value of T in this case? No. Nope. Six. It's a six because G of C is a three, and then the actual distance of the edge from C to E is also a three. So three plus three is a six. So that means your T is a six. And then we have to ask, uh, did we just find a shorter path to E? We looked up G of E, it's, it was an eight, and now we found a shorter path. So that means we've got a bunch of stuff to update again. So we have to add E to the set of O, but it's already here, okay? So that means you know, as far as we are concerned, it is still just B and E left in the set O. But this time, the purple edge is kind of a complicated thing because we have to remove the original purple edge and then we just have, we add a new edge. So now we say, uh-uh, this is not the way we want to get to E. We want to get to E through this edge here. Is that okay? Because we just updated who is the previous vertex of E. Are you still doing okay? I know you know, it's late in the day and we are almost done with the class. Yep. Because you can only have one previous. So when you update the previous of E, you cannot have the previous of E being D and C at the same time. You can only keep track of one back pointer of a vertex. Is that okay? All right. And then we have to update um, the G value and also the F value. So uh, we are updating E. So it is now updated to a six, oh, wrong color, but it's okay. It's not, big, it's not a big problem here. So this is updated to a six, and this is also updated to a six at this point. All right, so we are now done with the inner loop, the for each loop. We go back to the while loop, and then we ask the same question again. Of the two remaining vertices in O, does at least one of these have a F value that is less than the G value of E, which is our destination? The G value of E is a six, and then the F value of, did I forget, did I update the wrong thing? I think I did. It's not, no, I did not update the wrong thing. So between B and E, okay, um, the F value of B is a five. It is still less than the G value of um, E, which is a six. So the condition of the while loop is still true, which means we go in. So now once we go in, we use this one here to ask, Okay, of B and E, which one looks the most promising? So we are really just comparing the F values. So you look at the F value of B, it is a five. You look at the F value of, um, I think I did something wrong. It's a four plus one. No, no, it, it's fine, Never mind. So this is a five and the other one is a six. So we have to choose the five. Yep, okay. So we choose the one, the five, which is the B. We take it out of the set. 
and then we uh, it, and then we explore the outgoing edge of D. So that has only one single outgoing edge to E again, right? So now we have to recompute the T. So now we have to look at G of B, which is a four, plus the actual distance of the edge, which is one. Four plus one is a five. So T is a five. And now we ask, well, did we find a shorter path to vertex E? The answer is yes, we did. So now we have to go through all of that stuff again and update a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> the first thing we update is to add E to the set O again, but it has it already, okay? So there's really no effect that we can see. Um, and then we update the previous of E, and we go like, guess what? That edge that we update earlier, that's not a good edge anymore. To get to E, it's best to use BE, uh, BE as an edge, okay? So now we kind of go back to, up to update G of N. G of N is just updated to the value of T. So that means the way we do this <clears throat> is to say, oh, this is now updated to a five. And the same thing over here, this is updated to a five. And that concludes the inner loop. And then we go back to the outer loop, right? So we go back to the outer loop here. And we ask, okay, so of all the elements in O, do we find at least one of them having an F value that is less than G of the destination? Well, the only vertex left is vertex E. So we are really just comparing F of E, which is a five, versus G of E, which is also a five. Is five less than five? Nope. So we don't have to look any further. And this concludes the algorithm. So the question is, so what is our solution? The solution is starting from the destination and then use the previous arcs to trace your way all the way back to the start vertex. So that means in this case, we are starting with vertex E, follow the only previous to B, and then follow the previous of B all the way back to A. This becomes the shortest path. That becomes the solution. All right, are we doing okay so far? It's it's still being recorded, <laughs> so that's the that's the good news. And then the other good news is uh, we have like five days before Monday. <laughs> so if you want to kind of go back to the video and watch this, you'll kind of at a slower pace and then annotate all the updates and clean up, you know, all the stuff here that was handwritten into a spreadsheet, you can do so over the weekend. And as you go through that, jot down your notes, okay? Why are we doing this? How is this helping us to find the shortest path? Yep. Next Wednesday? Well, Thanksgiving is, uh, as far as we are concerned, the holiday is Thursday and Friday only. So we still have class on Wednesday. If I could add additional classes, I would, but the college would not let me do that. <clears throat> you get more value per dollar than you pay for the tuition. <laughs> All righty. So I'll see you guys next Monday. Oh, you mean the heuristics? Yeah. Well, I was trying to design something that will help, that will con try to confuse the A star algorithm. So the way I you know, set this up is I, I make things look more promising when it's really the worst path. So the worst path looks the most promising because of the heuristic. Yep. And then the second you know, worst path has the second most promising uh, heuristic. When you add up the heuristic and the actual cost of the edge, it looks the second most promising. And then the best path, the shortest path, looks the worst because I actually use the exact value of the edge as the heuristic. So that's why, you know, the, from the perspective of the heuristic, I'm, I'm trying to trick the A star algorithm to explore as much as possible because every single time it thinks, oh, this looks most promising, ah, it's the wrong path. This looks most promising. It's the wrong path again. So you don't have to like come up with the value of the 
Um, it depends. <laughs> in the uh, assignment, I will give you all the values. So you just kind of follow the algorithm and do all the math. You'll just kind of fill in uh, this part of the table. But in the exam, you know, I can change the form of the question so that, you know, I, I, I'll show you guys. Okay, there, there's a variety of questions I can ask with this type of algorithm. Mm -hmm. Typically, like when you would be writing an algorithm, would, uh, there would, would it just be a separate function to find out what the heuristic is? Yes. So typically, the heuristic is, has a computational way to find out. Yeah. Um, in this case, you know, I'm just you know, illustrating the worst case, you know, how, can, yeah, how, how you can make it ugly. What if the end cost is uh, Correct. Worse. This is worse. This is worse because the other way, yeah, this is not faster. This is no faster than the other way. But in reality, the heuristic function is something that is, there's, there's a formula to, equal, to, to compute it. Okay. it. Usually it's a fast way to. Yeah. Yep. It's just a little guidance. It's like, you know, uh, like in the map example, um, the the shortcut of the heuristic is really the, just the distance of the short of the straight line. Yeah. But it's still giving you valuable information because you wouldn't have to go beyond Oklahoma City, yeah. you know, to realize, oh, this is the wrong direction. I'm not going to find the shortest path from here. That's basically what the heuristic function is supposed to do. Okay. It's to so like guide. In this case, like, we can just change it or like give, yeah. give in. Exactly. So in, in all of these examples, I give you the specific heuristic value because you know there's no there's no restriction to say that it has to be computed in a way. So I can just assign values to the heuristic. And there's just like a value associated with every node or every relationship to their destination. That is correct. Okay. So there's no need for heuristic function between let's say A and B because you know, it never comes into play. It's only you know, a vertex to the end, to the end vertex. And then if you were just writing a computation, you would want the heuristic to be on top of it. Yep. Yep. And each vertex can be representing a lot of different things too, because you know, in compiler you know, design, um, each vertex can be representing how we use registers. To store temp you know, to store values that you have in your uh, source code. Okay. So the question is, you know, what is the best way to utilize the registers so that you don't have to recompute a value unnecessarily? So in that case, the edges are really representing, or the uh, estimated distance of the edges is really the cost of recomputing a certain value or the amount of time that it takes to push a value onto the stack and also to pop it you know, back from the stack later on. And then when you're conceptualizing it, like, so G is just like the estimated? No, G is not estimating. G, G, is the, G is the actual, actual. yeah. So F is the estimated? Yeah, so F is the combination of the exact and also the estimated. So when you look at this picture, the G is the squiggly, yeah. and then the F is the dotted line. The dotted line is just an estimate. It's just like, oh, okay, give me a second. I'm guessing, you know, this, you know, the distance from vertex V to vertex X is no more than blah. That's, that's basically all it's saying. Yeah, and that's the heuristic, right? The that's the heuristic. And it's a quick to compute function. Typically, it takes very little time to compute. But when you combine the two, the green squiggly line versus the green dotted line, that becomes an esti the, the estimated length of the shortest path from the start vertex through vertex V to the destination. So it's like saying this is possibly the shortest distance. We don't know, you know if yeah. so. If this but it's not, not. <laughs> so basically, if you go back to the map example, yeah. we're starting with a uh, Wichita, Wichita, yeah. and this is Oklahoma City. V is Oklahoma City, and X is San Francisco. So you're really asking and say, I know the shortest you know, uh, distance from. Uh, Wichita to Oklahoma City is this much, this many miles. Yeah. 
and then from Oklahoma City to San Francisco, I'm just going to guess, okay, using the straight line distance, it's going to be this many, this many miles. So that means the actual, the length of the actual shortest path from Wichita through Oklahoma City to San Francisco is go, it's not going to be better than that estimate. Yeah. So if you already know a certain you know, path that is actually going from Wichita to San Francisco, which is the blue line, and if the green stuff is not beating it, then you go like, okay, we don't have, have to explore any further you know, you know, what we can do from Oklahoma City because there's no way it can beat the blue line. And this, this line out here. Yes. Yep. Okay. Hey guys, I'm sorry. I, yeah, probably just need to look at it a little bit more. Yeah, it takes time to sink in and, yeah. and also go through some examples. Yeah, and I feel like the symbols, like, when they're, like, represented symbolically, they don't really register at this point. Yeah. But, like, if I think of that, about, like, G is exact. G is, but yeah. G is not going to the destination. G yeah, is only like between, two. between the start yeah. and a particular vertex. Yeah. But the F is from the start through a particular yeah. vertex to, to the, the end, to the destination. So you have to keep that in mind. Is you know the when you add up the squiggly and the dotted, that's F. Yeah. The dotted itself is H. Is that's just the heuristic. And then the squiggly is the G. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I think the first go around, I kind of was confused. Because it seemed like the heuristic value would be like one value for all of the vertices. But knowing nope. that there's a heuristic for every single vertex. Yep. Um, kind of clicked. Yeah. And we only really care about the heuristic from a vertex to the destination. So the heuristic between all of the other vertices is not relevant. It's not useful at all. It's not useful at all. Yeah, because you know when you look at this. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's not useful in the sense like it won't tell you the fastest way. It, we are not even using it. The algorithm would not refer to it. Yeah. So when you look at the heuristic here, we never really figure out what is h of a b. You know, what, what is h of a c? What is h of you know, uh, a d? Because those are not relevant. I don't need to know that. Because the algorithm, you know, okay, if you look at the algorithm, the only times we refer to the heuristic function is always from a particular vertex to the destination. So that's why, you know, it really is not exactly <laughs> um, the way it's described here, because we only need a subset of this to handle everything that we need. Because, you know, when we do need the heuristic function, it's only asking about the heuristic function or the heuristic value between a particular vertex and the destination. And then the Cartesian product of B and C would go through, it goes through, through every single one. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. But that's a minor point. You know, it's just a matter of oh, so you so we didn't really need to make this gigantic function. We could have just settled for a much smaller one. That's about it. Yeah. Okay. Which is also confusing because it is. Like, you tout it as being quicker than search does, but when you mess with the heuristic to like make it slower. Yeah. Like, so I understand the reason why you <laughs> would do that, but it's also like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in real life, you know, most heuristic functions are not like this. Yeah. So they are quote unquote monotonic in a certain way, which means um, a path that has a longer shortest path would always end up having a larger heuristic, heuristic value. So in real life, you know, most heuristic function has that property, yeah. which means you know, it's, even though it's not exact, it does it would do a pretty good like job. Yeah, that. exactly. Oh, this example is, this example is, yes. this example is set up to trick the A star algorithm. So it actually has to go through multiple iterations to find the shortest path. And yep. I was looking on Wikipedia and there was like this little example where the heuristic became more and more accurate and so it would have to uh, map less or like it would explore like less vertices. Oh, so you mean so you have to solve a problem repeatedly 
So every time you solve the problem, you store the actual length of the shortest path because the length of the shortest path is the exact length of the heuristic, of the oh, okay. right? So if you can cache that, that means you know, further runs of the same algorithm using the same vertices can be a whole lot faster because now your heuristic becomes the exact value as the length of the shortest path. Uh, okay. is, is that what the Wikipedia okay. thing is talking about? Uh, it was just like a little animation. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, this one does not change. I mean, the heuristic value of this algorithm is constant. You know, once you set it to be a certain thing, it does not change over time. So if the heuristic itself is changing, is adaptive, then it's a probably a different yeah. algorithm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think the little captions like illustration of a star search to find uh -huh. the path between two points on the graph. And left to right, a heuristic that prefers points or heuristic. Oh, I think they are, they're using four different sets of heuristics. Yeah. Yeah, so the first one is basically a breadth first search because it doesn't actually feel, there's no shape to it. Yeah. And then, the, and then as it becomes more informed, it forms more of a straight line because it knows it doesn't, if it strays a little bit too far away, then the heuristic is going to say, nope, this is not going to work out. Right. Yeah, so I think each horse is representing a different set of heuristic function. Sure. And it is, it's increasingly informed, which means you know, the heuristic value is closer to the actual length of the shortest sure. path yeah, as okay. you go from left to right, right. in those pictures. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. So it's not changing the heuristic no. function itself, yeah. it's, it's just a different set. Different. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this one is worse than you know, a zero because a zero simply means uninformed. This one is actively trying to yeah. get A star to do the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it still works out, it still finds the shortest path. Yeah. So the algorithm is good. You know, it's just that, you know, your not heuristic good. can be messed up, but it's still good. Yeah. As long as it is not overestimating. Because if the heuristic is overestimating, you can miss the shortest path then. Okay. And then when you, if you, um, like, let's say you were to do this again, mm -hmm. you just add another row for uh, whatever's in the parentheses. Yeah. And then add another row for pref. Yeah. Okay. I forgot about those two. Yeah. The pref is actually this is this may be a slight, slightly better representation because that's basically what we're trying to do is to start when everything is done we start with a destination and then we use the pref to backtrace the route to the starting yeah, point. But then we would have to update the pref, right? As we find the better stuff. Right, and that's why we cross out you know the pref here. Go like okay, that's not the, the best way to get to e anymore. The best way to get to e is c. And then we go like, nope, that's not the best way either. We have to go back to you know, BE. So that's the last update of the pref of E in this case. Okay. And then for like the exam, mm -hmm. we expect you to like come with uh, doing this. <laughs> I'll show you some examples of the exam. So I would uh, sometimes I give you a trace without you know, all the numbers. And then you have to go back and say, okay, how can I you know, tune the heuristic to make that happen? So that, that gets a little bit complicated, sure. yep. But it still boils down to, you know, whether you have a thorough understanding of the algorithm, you know. Okay. And, like, does our discussion of these two algorithms continue in the next classes, or? No, nope, this is it. Okay. Yeah, so A star is the last algorithm of the graph you know, module, so this is it for graphs. Okay. And then, uh, will there be an assignment on A star? Yep. Okay. So there's a separate assignment for A star which is eh, kind of like this, you know, I give you the, the graph, sure. you know, configuration, I give you the heuristic, you know, values, you just have to follow the uh, algorithm to get it done. Sounds good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a nice weekend.